So here we go. Um, welcome again. Uh, this is going to be a workshop that is trying to introduce you to advanced research computing, but also explain a little bit what I mean by that, uh, what some other names are for it, and kind of how things work when you move away from your, uh, your own desktop or laptop and you go compute remotely. Um, what you will need to follow along uh, in this workshop, this session, is an SSH client. In other words, you will be able, you have to be able to connect to, uh, in this case, the Graham supercomputer uh, with an SSH client, and we will go over how that works. Uh, but if you're on a Linux or a Mac, you most likely already can use SSH just as a command in the terminal. So you open the terminal, and uh, you will use the SSH command. If you're on Windows and you haven't done this before, um, the quickest way to get started that will actually uh, complete within the time span of our workshop is a utility called MOBA Xterm. So I, I put the link there. By the way, the slides of this uh, workshop are already on the uh, on the course website. You might have scrolled down a little bit, but you should be able to find them there. And the links uh, should be live in that version. Um, so with MOBA Xterm, you can also open a terminal and uh, uh, type in commands, much as in uh, Linux or the Mac. And make sure you can log into the course website so that you can take the attendance. Uh, so I, again, I, I put the link there, but you won't be able to do the link until you get the slides, and you'll be able to get the slides unless you log into the course site. So this one is circular. Um, uh, this is the attendance activity, and also uh, take a moment to do the, uh, the general survey if you haven't done that yet. The most important part here is to be able to, to get an SSH client. For those of you that don't have a terminal on Linux or, or Mac OS, um, take a moment to install MOBA Xterm. There's a free version, that's all you need, um, and, and that will serve you well. Okay, so with that out of the way, uh, what are we going to talk about today? Um, we're going to talk about what advanced research computing is. It's often abbreviated as ARC, ARC. Um, I'm going to talk about the ARC resources that are available um, in Canada, but also uh, typical ones that are available worldwide, just as a uh, an example, how do you access, the, uh, access these resources? So um, when you need them, how do you get them? Um, how do you connect? How do you operate? That's going to be the, a major part of what we're looking at today. So it's going to be a little bit, there's going to be some hands-on sessions where we're going to try things out with your guest accounts. Um, so one of the things we will have to look at uh, is a thing called job scheduling. Uh, resources are scarce, and so there's a scheduler that um, coordinates the usage. We'll go into that. Uh, we'll also talk about parallel processing. In most cases, when you're uh, running out of resources on your own uh, computer workstation or lab uh, uh, resources, uh, it means you have too many things to do. And the only way to speed that up really is to do them in parallel. So we'll talk about that. And then we'll end with some tips and best practices. I am going to try and keep an eye on the chat and a different display that I have here. Um, so if you have questions, uh, feel free to type them in. Uh, but you know, as things go, um, the, uh, the other support uh, people might pick them up. OK, so what is advanced research computing? What are we talking about? So just as a matter of and these are mostly my personal definitions, but they are fairly accurate, I would say. Um, when people talk about research computing, that's a very general term. Um, that's whenever you're doing research that depends on a computer. And that sounds a little silly, but I do not mean writing a paper or uh, even fairly simple spreadsheets. Um, I mean, your research wouldn't happen without computational resources. This could be data analysis, large data. It could be large computations, large simulations. Could be little simulations, but lots of them. Um, any, anytime you're doing that, you're doing research computing. And it doesn't necessarily have to happen anywhere else but on your own computer. It could, right? If that is enough, you're still doing research computing. And there's a whole bunch of techniques that come into play when you're doing research computing, which I won't talk about today. Today is going to be more about advanced research computing. And that is the same thing, except um, it doesn't fit on your computer anymore. And so you're going to have to find other resources. Those are not your resources. You're sharing these resources. And so because of that, things work a little bit differently. 
Um, so advanced research, really, the advanced part is only, um, it's no longer fitting on your computer, as far as I'm concerned. But that does mean that you might need experts' advice. So uh, that's what uh, the people at the Alliance, the Sharknet, Cynet, and CAC are all about. These are, these are the experts. Uh, we can help you with this. You often hear this, this word supercomputing um, as being sort of the same or different from advanced research computing. There's a large overlap. You could say supercomputing is when you're, the computer you're using for your advanced research computing is a large shared uh, custom system that uh, is hosted somewhere else. And so in many cases, when you're doing advanced research computing, you are doing supercomputing. Um, if you did not need large uh, resources, you wouldn't do it. You would do it on your own computer, and it's not advanced. Um, so from my, from my point of view, those are kind of synonymous. The things you are doing your advanced research computing on could be called advanced research computing clusters or supercomputers. And, and really, uh, to a large extent, those are the same. Um, that's not everybody's definition. That's just my definition for today. Um, high performance computing is yet another term that is always thrown around uh, when people are talking about uh, supercomputing or advanced research computing. And again, it's kind of the same thing uh, because by its name, high performance computing is whenever your the speed of your computation matters, which is almost always, right? So when when you have when you can't run it on your own computer, it means that it wasn't fast enough, right? Speed matters um, in that case. And it might not matter as much as in other cases. So there are certain cases where people really have to go in the nitty gritty of how they program the code, uh, how communication is done, how things scale up. And those are all important things. And, and that's when you get into sort of the, the technical high performance computing. But as soon as you're running on more than one core at the same time, in a sense, you're doing high performance computing because if you do this inefficiently, you're going to be kicked out. So I'm going to talk about supercomputing and advanced research computing kind of as if they are the same. But when I'm talking about a cluster like the one you see here, the one you see in the picture is called Niagara. It's the one that we host at uh, U of T, at Cynet. Um, I'm going to call them supercomputers just because it's a, it's a nice phrase to use. Um, so when do you need supercomputing? Uh, you need supercomputing when your problem takes too long, so you need faster computation, or your problem is too big and you need more memory or more storage, uh, or your data is just too big um, and it just doesn't fit. And so you're going to need supercomputing. Um, now, there's a whole bunch of things that supercomputer involves, um, and we won't go on in all of them, but it's uh, it gets technical at some level. Um, so this this is going to be an intro, so we're not touching on a lot of these uh, possible facets of supercomputing. But it involves everything from the hardware, which could be very specific, and you might have to tune things for it, the algorithms that you're using uh, to make sure things run on parallel, um, the software you're using, uh, the data management, um, uh, your, your uh, visual data management, your data transfer, your storage, all those things are part of uh, of how you do your supercomputing or your advanced research computing. And it's needed everywhere. It, it, there's almost no field that doesn't use research, comput research computing anymore. Um, and, and most fields are growing. And so at some point, they're gonna, they are going to hit a, a, a point where they have to go off their own computers. Uh, computational fluid dynamics, molecular dynamics, uh, Monte Carlo simulations, quantum chemistry, bioinformatics, digital humanities, data science, machine learning, AI, all of that um, needs supercomputing. And the fact that you are here uh, uh, tells me that you're at least interested in it, but probably also thinking about doing advanced research computing or supercomputing. So insert your research area here. All right. So that's great. There are these systems, and we'll look at the systems um, in, in some sort of detail on what is available and how you should use them. But one warning uh, that I should make very early on, especially because we're talking about supercomputers and it has the, the word or phrase super in it, is that they're not that super um, in, this, in the following sense. So there once was a time in which computers were getting faster uh, very steadily. And so if you had an, a problem 
uh, and your computation was too slow, you could actually wait a year and then uh, buy a new computer, and that computer would be twice as fast, and so now it would probably be possible to do your computation. Um, that's because the, the, the processor speeds themselves were increasing. Um, the picture doesn't entirely show it because the scales are, or the axes aren't that great, but this blue line here uh, shows how fast processes are running uh, in, in megahertzes. And you see that after about 2003 or so, it plateaued. We're always looking, if you look at the gigahertzes that are quoted for cores, um, uh, CPU cores, there are always a few gigahertzes. That used to not be the case. You know, it started in megahertzes and then it slowly went up, but it stopped there. So they don't get faster anymore. And that is purely because of physical limits. You, you cannot make them faster or your chips will melt. And if they melt, they don't work. So these physical limitations, this trend stopped. Um, which means that chips aren't getting faster. Okay. Um, what they are getting is bigger and not faster. So you get more hardware and specifically um, you get more of this of a similar hardware. And the only way to get things done faster is not to run it on a supercomputer in the same way, but to run it on a supercomputer and use the fact that they have more hardware. And that means parallel processing. So you'll have to do things in parallel at the same time. Um, and then because it's bigger, there's more hardware, those will happen at the same time. Um, but it's just, it's more, it's about getting more done rather than getting things faster done. So some of you might have heard of this thing called Moore's Law. Moore's Law, uh, simply plotted here, although the graph doesn't extend until today, uh, looks at the transistors uh, per chip as a function of year. So you look at a chip, how many transistors are on that, and it grows um, exponentially. And it, it has continued to grow exponentially for a while. That is Moore's law. It describes the long-term trends in computing or really manufacturing of computing hardware in that the number of transistors that you can place inexpensively on an integrated circuit doubles roughly every two years. Um, and that's still true, although that even that is uh, approaching its end, but that is true um, which sounds like it's weird, because in, in around 2003, 2005, um, we see this plateauing. So how do we rhyme these two uh, statements? And that's because Moore's Law doesn't say that these transistors are running any faster. So it used to be that if you have more transistors per square inch, they're closer together. If they're closer together, they can communicate faster, and therefore they can run faster. That doesn't happen anymore because to have them run faster, they would heat up and it would melt. So this is what I mean with power density is a limiting factor here. We cannot speed them up anymore, but we can still have more transistors. And in fact, um, the, the way that it is implemented is that you get multiple cores. So a single CPU usually has multiple cores, and those cores are like their own little CPU. They can do one thing at a time, and the different cores can do different things at the same time, and in that way, we can get, again, more done. So you have more hardware. This is true. That trend is still uh, more or less happening. Um, but you get it in, in uh, the, an increase in the number of cores. OK, well, that's fine. We don't care. Um, however, we get our transistors. We just get, get more cores. And so it's faster, right? I just run my computation on more cores. And that should work. Unfortunately, that is also not the case. Um, one does not simply throw more cores at one's computation. Um, this does not work. Um, those cores wouldn't know which part of your computation they are supposed to handle and how to coordinate things. Most algorithms are uh, at least written down serially. So uh, step one, step two, step three, step four. Um, there is no way that these cores can figure out if they can do step four before step three. Uh, and so if they can't figure it out. There's just one core working if you just throw it on. So just running, uh, just having more cores is a little bit like having more workers. So you can uh, follow the analogy with a, a human resources dilemma where a job has to be done faster. But you can't, has, you can't hire faster people. That, that 
know, you can hire a little bit faster people, but not substantially faster people. So the only thing you can do is hire more people. But now you have to change the workflow. How this work, how this job gets done, won't be the same. You will have to coordinate uh, between the, these these uh, people. You have to split up the work and make sure that uh, they don't do the same work. Make sure that the work they do doesn't depend on work that has to be done before by somebody else. And so it, it requires a rethinking of the whole workflow process, and it requires some administrative overhead. The same is true when you're computing on multiple cores on a supercomputer. It, it's in parallel, but you will have to uh, express or, 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 or program in how these cores are, are used. It's not automatic. Just having more cores does not help you if you do not uh, make your workflow parallel. <clears throat> okay, so that's the why and the what. Um, what do we have available for you? Well, or what is there out there in the in the world in terms of these supercomputers? So when you're going away from your uh, from your laptop or your workstation, where, uh, what will you find out there? What kind of systems are you running on? And um, so one thing to keep in mind is this is going to be different from your laptop. It's going to be different from your workstation. Um, the architecture of supercomputers is just different. There is a lot of similarities, so a lot of the programs might work. But as I said, if you just run the same program on a supercomputer, it will run just as fast or maybe even slower than your own laptop because the supercomputer was built a few years ago. Um, you have to do this parallelism thing. In addition, it's a shared system, and it's a, a, it's a specific, uh, specifically designed system. So we're going to go over a few typical architectures that you find out there um, that you should be aware of and that you will have to um, fit your workflow into. And so those, the three main ones are clusters, multi-core computers, and accelerators. And so we'll look at those three. Okay. So cluster, what is a cluster? A cluster is like taking uh, powerful standalone computers, um, like, like a workstations um, that could do a computation themselves. We will call those computers nodes because we're going to link them up with a network. And so uh, here's a node. Node 4, for instance, has a CPU. That's the circle here and some RAM in it. That's square. And then there's other nodes in the same cluster. And we put some wires in between them, uh, which we call a network or an interconnect. And uh, now they can commu communicate. So that is easy to build, easy to expand, because if you need uh, a larger computer, you just buy some more nodes and you put them, uh, you put some wires uh, uh, into the switches and, and you're done. And so building it is pretty simple. Um, each node, uh, so each circle here has its own memory uh, because it's just a box. Uh, and so the different nodes a priori cannot see each other's memory. And that makes it a little tricky to work together on a, uh, a problem. Um, and that's, this is why this is called a distributed memory system. So if you have a uh, if you have a problem that doesn't fit in your in one workstation's memory, you're going to have to divide it up, and the different nodes will have different parts of your uh, your system of your of your data. Um, and there, there's going to have to be a way in which those nodes tell each other um, if they need the data from the other node. So nodes have to communicate with one another and transfer data through what is called messages. So they, they literally would send messages over the network saying, hey, um, I, I'd like some data. And the other node go over here, here's some data. Those messages will have to happen over the network. The main way people program when this is necessary, so when your uh, system does not fit into a single node, um, or when uh, you need more cores than a single node can provide, is called message, message passing interface, MPI. And later on in the uh, in the summer school, there will be a course on MPI. I think it's a two-day course. Uh, so if you're interested in that, but that that kind of uh, programming typically happens in uh, C, C++, or Fortran. Although you can do it in Python as well. Another type of supercomputers are multi-core computers. Um, that's when you have a single workstation, so but they have multiple cores. And as I said, that's where things have gone. So, uh, 
single CPUs do not contain just one core, they have different cores that can run at the same time, but they share memory. So in that same workstation, you would have one block of memory and they can all see the same memory. And so they can coordinate their work, the cores can coordinate their work through the memory. Um, now, although the number of cores is increasing, uh, so for instance, on, uh, on Niagara, the number of cores per node is 40. On Graham, the typical one is 32, but I think they have a couple of nodes of 48 as well. Um, used to be much less. And if you buy like a laptop, it probably has four cores. Um, but it's built to cores, the, 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 the architecture is the same. The trouble is, although the number of cores is increasing, as the number of cores increases, the, it gets more expensive to do all this, all this communication through memory uh, for technical reasons, but it, it gets more expensive. Um, the coordination now can be done by memory. That's great. Um, and so these are called shared memory systems. Um, they should just be called computers now because any computer is multi-core, but they're called shared memory systems. Um, the way you program them is, is typically with things like threads or OpenMP, um, where uh, you have uh, several um, threads of execution running on the cores and um, all seeing the same memory. So as I said, most systems out there, your desktop, your laptop, your cell phone, they have this architecture where there's a shared memory and cores are, are viewing that. Um, and this is, this is great. This is the easiest way to program in some sense um, because you don't have to think about dividing up the data. The data is all in memory. But um, you can only go so big with the number of cores you get. So if you need more than uh, on America 40 cores, uh, you're going to have to do a combination of multi-core computers and a cluster. A third type of uh, supercomputer, although it's not a standard mode supercomputer, uh, is this thing called accelerators. So accelerators almost always nowadays mean graphical processing units, so GPUs. Uh, it turns out mm -hmm. graphics cards are really good at parallel processing uh, of very uh, uh, streamlined calculations. And so people have figured out, hey, we can just use these GPUs for scientific computing, and they can. They're very fast. They're good at massive parallel processing. They're not good at things that have a lot of decisions to be made. Um, so not everything fits nicely on accelerators, but those things that fit nicely on, uh, on this hardware in terms of how, uh, how they run um, are, are, are great. It is a bit more complicated program because it's like a graphics card. It's, so it's in a node, in a uh, computer. You put a card in that. Now you've got an accelerator. But your program is running not on the accelerator, it runs on the CPU cores. And now um, you have to program ways of uh, calling, uh, uh, or sending data over to the, to the accelerator and uh, um, running things on the accelerator. And so it's a little bit more program to, uh, complicated to program. Again, uh, you can program in different ways, though. Uh, CUDA, OpenACC, OpenMP, OpenCL are a few of the, uh, the programming models you can use. And there's going to be a CUDA course later in this uh, summer school as well. I think that one is three days, so it will happen a little later. And again, CUDA is really a C++ uh, extension, and so that's you have to think of, of it in that sort of way. It is not impossible to use the accelerators from, say, a Python or even an R, um, but it's a bit trickier, and um, um, usually people use, use uh, CUDA. Or they use what I would call implicit programming. So if you're doing artificial networks or other machine learning, usually they come. Uh, there's a framework for that. So you do not program in the exact uh, uh, computation. You say, this is how my, uh, my neural net is laid out. And you can do that, say, in, in, in Python. And they use a package like TensorFlow. And it does all of the offloading to the, the accelerator, make sure that everything runs properly. Um, and so that, that kind of programming for sure you should be doing it in a, in a language like Python, because there's nothing to be gained uh, from, from going to, to, uh, to another language. All of the heavy lifting is done by the framework. OK, so um, as I alluded to already, these accelerators are combined with a host. So the host, in this case, would be the, uh, the node or the, or the workstation that the accelerator card is plugged into. And so you've got. A, a heterogeneous system. There's some, uh, let's say, regular cores or CPU cores, and then there's the accelerator that is separate, and things have to be uh, coordinated between the two. So those are the three main types, but almost 
every supercomputer that you will find out there is a combination of these three. So um, you could have a workstation that is multi-core, so then you have just your multi-core. Uh, you could have a workstation with multi-core and accelerators, then you already have two of the kinds. But you wouldn't call it supercomputer yet, but as soon as you make a cluster out of those, you have all three. And so let's look at some of the top supercomputers in the world. So there's a list, uh, the, the top 500 uh, of uh, the fastest supercomputers in the world, in the sense that uh, people that have a supercomputer or centers that have a supercomputer will have to do a certain benchmark uh, test. Um, a certain speed comes out, they can submit that. And so it's the top 500 fastest supercomputers in the world that, that people want you to know about. So there might be more that we don't know about, but this, these are the known ones. The number one at the moment, so I'm not going to even mention the actual performance of these because that doesn't really matter so much, but I'm going to matter, mention the architecture of a couple of these just to show you what these look like. So the number, the number one at the moment, uh, the list was updated in, in actually in May, uh, but they call it a June list, um, is Frontier in the USA. Um, and it operates national labs, and it consists of almost 10,000 nodes. Each of those nodes has 64 cores, so it's a multi-core machine, but it is also a cluster. Each of those nodes has eight GPUs, or four, depending on your count, how you count, but let's say eight GPUs. Um, and so it has all three layers, um, cluster, multi-core, and GPU. Um, each of the nodes has a certain amount of memory, so 500 gigabytes, so that's shared amongst, I think in this case, actually shared amongst the cores and the GPUs um, because of the architecture. Um, and it has a specific uh, network by which these uh, nodes are interconnected. Uh, in this case, it's called a slingshot network. The network is very important um, if you have to run on more than one node, um, because if the network is, is bad, um, you will spend all your time communicating over the network, and you actually get no, no work done. So the network is, is what sets apart uh, some of the fastest uh, supercomputers from just a regular cluster of, of um, connected nodes. So it needs all of these together to become the fastest one. Uh, the second fastest one is called Fugaku uh, in Japan. It has way more nodes, uh, 158,000 something nodes. Um, each has 48 cores and 32 gigabits of memory uh, with a specific network. And interestingly enough, this one does not have any GPUs. So this one brings just on the fact that they have many, many nodes and many, many cores uh, and, and gets their performance out of that. So that is possible. Um, it's a design of some sort that you can make. Um, number three is in Finland. And this is a mixture. Um, mm -hmm. So it has a, a, a 1,500 nodes with uh, just uh, many cores and a good bit of memory, um, and then uh, about uh, 2,500 nodes uh, with uh, a bunch of cores and GPUs. So they have that they have that mix, and that makes sense because some applications just run run very well or are not ported to run on GPUs, and so it would be a waste to have every node have uh, GPUs and not use the GPU. GPUs aren't cheap, um, and and they take energy, and so this this kind of makes sense to have a a two-pronged approach. And you'll see um, as you get less specialized or uh, lower down the list, um, this, this happens all the time. So the number four, again, is, is, is this one in Italy, is a mix of nodes that have GPUs and do not have GPUs. Uh, the network here is a little bit, bit different. It's an infinity band network, which is typically the ones we have in, in Canada as well. Um, number five, uh, Summit, um, again, a GPU-heavy uh, node uh, uh, system. Um, these are not the ones that are available to you unless you have collaborators in you know, uh, the US or Italy or uh, Japan. But this is the, the architecture that you will find. And this goes all the way down to uh, the, the, the less large supercomputers. Uh, but it's a link to the, the ranking if you want. So what do we have in Canada? Uh, where are we in this list? Are we in this list? Yes, we are in this list. We're not in the first 100, but the top uh, listing in this list is Narval, which is in Coco, Quebec, so in, in Montreal. Um, and it's the number 108. And here, too, you see this mix of uh, nodes with and without GPUs. Um, 
they have a, a, a decent network, they have a decent RAM, they have a decent amount of cores per node. Um, it's just smaller, really. It, that, that net, there's only so much uh, budget for, for Canada versus the US, and you could imagine that. Um, the next one on the list is number 177, uh, called Niagara. I mentioned it already, uh, mostly because I have a picture of Niagara. I don't have a picture of Narval, so uh, that's in the slides. Uh, but it has about 2,000 nodes. This one has no GPUs. Um, and um, the reason for that is that we figured out from the uses that we had at the time that we built Niagara, which is about six, seven years ago, that um, users weren't really uh, needing GPUs as much as they needed um, CPU cores. And so this is a, uh, a, a CPU-only uh, system. It has a, 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 an interesting network that I won't go into, but it does make it uh, easier to scale up to uh, uh, runs that run on pretty much the whole system fairly efficiently. Uh, there's a small GPU expansion uh, miss, but it's a, it's a separate cluster, so that's not really part of my um, Next on the list is Cedar. Cedar is at uh, Simon Fraser, um, and it's number 195. It has a, a large mix of different nodes, uh, some with GPUs, uh, some with uh, more cores, some with uh, lesser cores. Um, it's very heterogeneous in that sense, um, which can be great to accommodate different workflows, but a little bit tricky because you kind of have to know what resources to ask, ask for. Um, uh, next on the list in Canadian systems is number 30, 384, Beluga, again, a mix of nodes. Um, and, um, and finally, no longer on the list, but still a, uh, a valuable uh, workhorse, if I may call it that, is Graham. Uh, Graham is situated in, uh, in, in Waterloo, um, uh, maintained by the uh, Sharknet folks that are also doing a lot of the trading. And this is where you will be working with your uh, your temporary account, with your guest accounts. Um, it has, similar to, to have Cedar, um, a great many different types of nodes, some with GPUs, some without GPUs, different kinds of RAM, different architectures. Um, that happens, especially when systems um, get a little older and get small extensions or larger extensions, uh, newer parts. Um, but so if you want to know more about any of these systems, I, I put a link to the Alliance documentation. Um, so you can you can look at, at the specs if that's if you're interested in that, but that's uh, that's what uh, that's what you have. So it really is that kind of heterogeneous mixed bag of architectures that we have to work with. Okay, so that's that's great, but you're not getting the whole system to yourself, um, even. Um, uh, even if you wanted to. Um, so you're going to be working on shared remote resources. These are not on your in your lab, uh, so you're going to have to connect to them remotely, and they're not just yours, so you're going to share them with other users. Um, so when you ask, may I have a supercomputer, please uh, the answer as well, sure. But if you need a supercomputer, right, as we said, you've outgrown your, com your own computer, um, and there's not a lot of people that can afford their own supercomputer. And so you're going to use one of the ones that are available to you in Canada. They are shared with hundreds or thousands of other users. Okay. Um, obviously, they're remote. Um, that's great. And sharing is good. I mean, these are shared systems. Sharing is good because even if you had your own cluster um, and you're doing research, part of the research is developing the computation. And that means while you're developing that, you're actually not computing. So you could have resources that are expensive and, 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 and costly, doing nothing, nothing for a while because you are writing the code. Um, when you have a shared resource, it's different. When you have a shared resource with hundreds of users, thousands of users, hundreds of groups, some of the groups are ready to run. Other groups may still be developing. That's OK. Um, when they're done developing, they will run. And so it gets tricky to make sure that it is fair, um, but it can be done. But if you do this properly, um, you have better what's called utilization. So you have a machine that costs a lot of money, but it's used all the time. Um, it also means that um, you will actually, as a researcher, get more resources. Because if you bought it yourself, 
and you're not using your system for half a year, you're basically getting half resources, right? Whereas if you're not using your allocation in, uh, in the Alliance for half a year, uh, it's not that it's all available, but it is possible to get a lot of work done in that second half of the year. Yeah, so there's a, a question whether you can combine different computer, uh, supercomputers. And um, if they're in different locations, typically the answer is no. Um, the network is very important, as I said, for this to happen. Um, and communication speeds are just naturally by the speed of light, um, not instantaneous. And so you can't take the system at SFU and the system at um, at, at Waterloo and combine them and do a calculation of both of them. But you can uh, run different ones at the same time. Uh, what's the typical usage of a cluster in Canada? It's typically over 90%. Um, so there's there's a waiting list. It's called a scheduler, and we'll, we'll look at that uh, in, in detail. But yeah, it's, it's essentially 100% used. Uh, the only time something doesn't get used is either something's broken and it gets fixed. Um, or um, there's a large computation that needs a lot of nodes at the same time, so we have to wait until we collect those nodes. And those are the only real reasons why there is. So it's not, uh, yeah, so that, that's, so you're always waiting in a sense. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, so CERN uses a grid system. So um, CERN, that's the uh, um, accelerator center in, in Switzerland, has a lot of data that has to be processed. But that data can be processed separately. So each event that they get from their collider um, can be sent off to different uh, clusters, and they will do the computing on it. And so because they're independent, they yes, they have this grid where they can send off um, uh, jobs. And so it is possible to, in theory, to combine the scheduling of jobs over different supercomputers. Um, but there's very few groups that really need it, and those that do, like CERN, have figured it out by themselves. So most supercomputers are uh, scheduling-wise standalone for that reason. It also makes it a little bit simpler to, uh, to avoid inefficiencies. Okay. So a supercomputer is remote and it's shared. And that, that is the main difference uh, or the main reason why there's differences uh, with how you use your own computer. So let's attack one thing first. Um, it's remote. So you're at your computer, I'm at my computer, you're somewhere, you have a computer or a laptop, maybe a phone. Um, the supercomputer is somewhere else. We call that a data center, typically. Um, that's where it is, and we will call it the server. And so we have to connect from our uh, own computer to the server. And by far the most common way people do this with, with, with clusters, with supercomputers, is with SSH, Secure Shell. Um, and you communicate with the supercomputer using a command line. Yes, a command line. It's all text-based. Um, virtually nobody uses a GUI in HPC. GUIs are great for interactive work. If you have more work than even your workstation can do, there's no way you're going to click your way through a thousand nodes of work. It just doesn't work. Right? It doesn't scale. And so that's so. It's not just because it's always been a command line. It's like there, it's not workable to tell a supercomputer to do a million clicks to get things done. Um, you're going to have to program that in with a command line. Um, if you've been to the Linux session last or uh, yesterday, you've gotten a little bit of an introduction on how it works. Um, if not, I'm hoping you come with a little bit of command line experience, a little bit of Linux. Um, if you don't, just stick around and, and, and get a flavor for it, but then it might be tricky to, to follow along. So. It's command line based. No, HP systems, HPC systems do not have GUIs. Um, they might have um, portals. They might have some interactive access, like a, a Jupyter notebook or something. But all of those are um, are at limited scale. There's no way you can use GUIs at scale at, for large computations. So they don't. Um, they don't. There are so. Portals and, and notebooks are as far as you get, but they don't run large computation. They're just an access point. Okay. 
Okay, so let's try this. Let's do a little hands-on. Let's try to get on to Graham. You should have a, uh, a guest account. If you didn't know you had one, um, you do. Uh, go to the course website. Uh, maybe I can show that for a second. So go to the course website, and here somewhere there should be a cluster account, username, and passwords. Um, so if you click on the link, it will tell you a username and a password. Those are the two things you're going to need. Uh, okay, so let's go back to. So what we're going to try and do is the following. Uh, So the first thing to do is to look up your guest account. The second thing to do is open a terminal. Um, could be a local terminal in MobX term. If you're on Windows, it could be a terminal in, uh, in a Mac. It could be a terminal in Linux. Find the terminal, search for terminal. Um, that will give you a, a prompt. So usually it's a, a, a a black screen could be a white screen background depends on the settings um, there will be a prompt um, that doesn't necessarily have to look like a dollar sign but often it does end on a dollar sign so whatever that prompt is that tells you uh, maybe what directory you're in and what your username is on these slides i will just abbreviate you a dollar sign because it's different everywhere what you have to type on uh, uh, type after that prompt is ssh then your username so they will start with guest and then it's a number uh, so let's say guest something 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 at graham.computecanada.ca this is not your email um that's just the syntax of this is your username and this is the host the server that we are going to connect to the supercomputer we're connecting to and then you type the password so we're going to start with that and um, give me a thumbs up if you've managed to to log in to have a little bit of an idea of um, of where we're at And obviously, if you have difficulties, ask questions in the chat, and, uh, and I or somebody else will uh, help you. But I'm seeing a good bit of successes. If you were here in the Linux session last uh, or yesterday, then you probably already had that. Okay, so the username and password again is on the course website. You just have to go to the probably on the left. If you're on the phone, things work differently. So if you're on a laptop, I think. On the left, you have a panel that says a bunch of things, like the attendance uh, uh, link, uh, but also cluster account, username, and password. Or it might stop at username because it doesn't fit. And that's where it is. Yes, you can use Putty. That's fine. Um, we're not using anything fancy. If you Putty already, that's fine. That should work. Um, so your username, and, and, and so the host is graham.computecanada.ca. Your username is guest something. And the password is whatever you find on the website. Yeah, so somebody's asking about a fingerprint, um, a key fingerprint. Yes, so that's that is it, it is important. Although with guest accounts, I guess you can uh, trust it. The first time you connect with SSH, SSH is fairly secure. Uh, the first time you connect with SSH on a server that it doesn't know yet, the server is going to send a fingerprint. It's basically a number or a hexadecimal string um, that identifies the host and then 
the SSH client, so your computer, is supposed to check if that is the right number for this host, but it doesn't know it yet because it's never contacted it. So um, you can be trust, you can be trusting and say yes, I I will accept that, and then the next time you SSH again, it will check the stored number or stored key fingerprint with the fingerprint that the, that the server is giving next time. So at least you know you're connecting to the same server again. It is possible um, to hack these things, it happens, um, and to uh, redirect uh, uh, requests for graham.computercanada.ca to somewhere else. Um, their fingerprint would be different and so you would detect it that way. If you want to make sure that the fingerprint is correct, go to the uh, docs.alliance.ca, uh, uh, alliancecan.ca, to the same one where all the links for the systems are, and look for fingerprints, and it will also list for you what the expected fingerprints are. So if you're a little bit more paranoid, um, you can uh, you can look up that the fingerprint is correct. Yeah. When you have your actual uh, uh, alliance account, this this is more important. Guest account will uh, you know they will cease to exist, and you can't do all that much with it. Um, and of course, this is a remote system. We're not going to talk too much about the security part of it. But this is a shared remote system. Don't put any, put any private information on there. Um, it, it, the different users are shielded from one another, but administrators could potentially see your stuff, not that they're going to. Um, it's just an extra risk that you're taking if you're putting private information on a shared system that hasn't been designed for it. Um, so these are shared research systems. Um, research data should go on there, uh, not private data. Uh, if you have an account for your research, yes, you can you can use that. Um, the only benefit for using guest accounts is that we have a re reservation for them. So um, if you've not run out of your fair share, if you have an account, you probably know what it is. If you have, have not run out of it, that will work. If you use the guest account, it doesn't hit your fair share. We're not going to do major computations, so it's fine. But I don't want you to wait in the queue for two days because your group has been using a lot of Graham in the past, and so you can't follow along. Permission denied. You probably typed the password wrong. Um, if not, let us know uh, what your user name is. Not a password, just a username. We, we, somebody might be able to, to delve into that. Hey, Will. How are you doing? How are you doing? Hello? Why are you going to have the... Oh, oh I, I unmute my Mac, sorry. <laughs> it happens, no worries. Oh, if you only do SSH and you don't do guests, so somebody has trouble, uh, then it will use as a username whatever your username is on your local computer, and that's probably not the same. So you do have to add guests at the server, or, or it's going to say uh, uh, permission denied. So if the username is, does not exist, permission denied. If the password is incorrect for username, permission denied. One thing you have to be a little careful about, if you try too many times with the wrong passwords, uh, and, and wrong usernames, you could be blocked. I don't, I forgot how many times, but so you know, try to get it right the first few times. No, so the username is not graham.computercanada.ca, that is the host name. Uh, the username is your guests and then a number. Let me know if that works for you.
I'm going to give everybody a little bit more time to, to figure this out. And, um, and make sure you can log in, because otherwise we can't do any of the other hands on. If you have a CAC specific account and it's not linked to CCDB, then yes, you're going to have to switch to your guest account. Um, but if it's, it, it depends on how, I'm not quite sure how Queens has set this up. Good. More people getting in. Good stuff. Now we'll be working on Graham. Um, I put anything you need there. It has a bunch of software already, so we don't need to, uh, to copy anything over. But for reference, it's good to know how to get data in and out of another system. And it's not through SSH. Um, so to transfer files, once you're on, say, Graham, uh, you can use the wget command. So if you know the URL of a file, get it from the, down, from the internet, you can do wget URL, and then it will download it. Um, if it's on your own computer, if you have some files on your own computer, um, you can use a copy variant of SSH called SCP or SCOPY. Um, and so you can copy a file or a directory for that matter, some extra options, but you can copy a file to Graham. And the syntax looks a little bit like SSH. So you say the source first. So say you have a file on your own computer, you're on your own computer, you're in a terminal. You can just copy the file name. Um, and then you say, again, guest at Graham computer.ca then a colon and then wherever you want that file to live so if you just said file name it would go to your home directory on Graham if it would if you give it a path then it will go in the subdirectory etc um, if you're doing a bunch of files at the same time um, you can do all directory you could use as copy there's another command called rsync um, there's a, there's a variety of ways you can you can do that um, but yeah you, you don't want to have to do it file by file if you have a lot of files um, if you have a lot of files, you might even think of zipping them up or tarring them up into an archive and copying this archive. Uh, it can be a lot faster than doing one file at a time. Um, if you want to get things off of Graham and you're already logged into Graham, um, you're stuck because the Graham supercomputer does not know where your laptop is or where your local. If it's a workstation and it has a, a public IP address, then you could, but most don't. So the way to copy things off of a supercomputer is to stay on your own computer and uh, run the s copy command with the source specified in this sort of SSH fashion. So uh, username, add host, colon, name, the, the file you want, and the file, the file you want from the remote system, and the, where it should land on your local system. So you have to sort of start from your own computer. Again, um, this is just if you want one file. If you have several files, you can do a whole directory. If you can, uh, if you do that, you probably want to use rsync because it's a little bit cleverer than than as copy and paste. Um, yes, there's also Globus. Um, it is a suitable uh, alternative. You can use Globus. It's a, a web-based uh, um, GUI um, that is very nice. It takes a little time to set up, so I'm not going to talk about it. But yes, that's that's an option too. And especially useful if you're doing a lot of uh, transfers often. Yes. So if you if you're a guest user and you want to copy the files from Graham to my my to your PC, you essentially use the last command here. So you you log out of it, of Graham again. Make sure you're on the terminal. Um, there's something similar in Putty as well, but I don't know how that works to be honest. But if you're on a terminal, you use the copy command. Um, and you know you have to know where the files are in Graham. Right now you don't probably have anything there, but if you have anything there, you know where the files is. And so you, you do your username at the host, so graham.computer.ca colon the file name on Graham, and then the file name that it should have um, on your own machine. Yeah. So the first one is get it from yeah exactly. So the first file is from your computer to Graham. The second is from Graham to your computer. Okay. 
Um, we're going to take a five minute break. You can keep working on this if you want. Um, we can keep asking questions, but I'm going to grab a coffee. Um, you can do the same uh, before we go. So you can either finish this up or, or uh, get yourself a, a beverage yourself if you want. Um, and then we'll get back here at 10.07. I'm going to answer some of the questions there in the chat by showing you um, how it works. Give me some, uh... Hi. So you should be able to see my terminal now. I hope. Somebody confirmed that they're seeing my terminal. I can see it. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, so I'm going to log into Graham with my guest account. This is my trial guest account. And it's a password. I think it's this. Nope. Didn't get that right. There we go. And I'm in. Now I'm in my home directory on Graham, or the guest's home directory. There's nothing in there. So if you know how to list content of a directory in Linux, that's ls. There is nothing there. Secretly, there's a little bit there. Uh, there's some hidden files there. Uh, with dash a. Um, if I wanted to know how much I can put there, there should be a disk usage command and it's going to tell me my my quotas now I don't have any projects so some issues here but um, usually in a real system it will give you the actual yeah the actual number I think for the guest accounts it's limited but typically you have about 50 gigabytes or something in your home directory clear the screen here um, downloading something you can do w gets That we get something from the internet. So test file is it there? Let's see more test file. Yes, it's there. Um, getting things from a repo. Git is there. And git clone. Git clone is there. And it's in the it's one of my projects. Um, what else? So yeah, you have about thirty gigabytes. How many? How many gigabytes can you transfer easily? And there's an issue because it depends on the speed, and the speed of of, of copying things depends um, as much on what is in between you and the uh, uh, the data center than anything else. The data center can be fast, but if the connection is not, it's going to be slow. Um, but anything up to about 10 gigabytes probably will make it through with an S copy or an R sync. Um, anything beyond that might have uh, some issues in, in just finishing a time. The nice thing about rsync, which, which is why I mentioned it over as copy, is that you can try the same rsync command again, and it will sort of try where you left off. So if you have a directory and part of it made it through, uh, but you got disconnected, the, the next rsync should get the rest of the stuff. Um, so that's kind of the, the order of a magnitude you have to think about. The connection to most of the uh, data centers in Ontario is pretty good. So if there is a speed issue, it's usually on your side. I will be happy to try and debug it with you, but it's usually on, on either your side or in between. Uh, um, that's that's the thing I think of. Uh, there's a question about VS code. Um, this is a double-edged sword because of the way VS code does things, but you can do remote uh, development with VS Code on the supercomputers. Um, it will install, VS Code will install some software in your home directory. Um, that's one thing that is not particularly nice, but it also tends to leave behind processes running when the remote session is no longer active. And that is, that is very annoying. So it's a little bit annoying, but it, it, it does work. It just means that you have to be a little bit uh, doing some cleanup every now and then on your account 
on the other side that is not just using VS Code. But yes, you can you can use VS Code um, and and just set up like you would you know Google it uh, how you set up an SSH connection within VS Code. Uh, but yes, that can be done. You cannot uh, do computation. So it, it, and and most of the uh, development of code is probably best done just locally anyway uh, for no. Well, uh, reducing the chance of, of disconnects and stuff like that. All right, so um, we're logged in. And if you haven't, uh, feel free. You can still ask questions, but um, uh, one of the other support people might be able to answer you. Um, but we are going to continue. So let me reshare my slides. OK. So we've logged in, great. We are actually not on the supercomputer. We are on what's called login nodes. Uh, login nodes is where we all uh, log in. So um, if you, um, so on that login node that, that we were with the guest account, we're all in there. There's actually, I think, two or maybe more login nodes in Graham. So we might be separated into two groups. These are not for computing. These are for setting up. Uh, your computations uh, for interacting with the system. Um, you have a home directory there. It's called dollar home um, as, a, as a, a variable. There's another directory called dollar scratch. And uh, that one's bigger. It's not backed up. It's where you do your computations. Because uh, when thousands of jobs are running at the same time, if they were all hitting home and something goes wrong, your important files are gone. So you use scratch for your, uh, for your actual computations. Um, the actual nodes of the cluster, where you want to run your computations, those thousands of, of nodes, um, are called compute nodes. And we, will, we want to access them, but we're not on them yet. So we connect to a logger node, not a compute node. You cannot log into the compute nodes. They are there where all the sharing happens. So when I say there's like over 90% utilization, those compute nodes are busy. Um, you want to get something done. You're going to have to ask for it. So you ask for it by writing a job script. Um, it's a little script, a little file, a little text file, typically written in, in uh, Bash, that contains both the requests for the resources that your job will need and what it should do. You give that job script to the scheduler. Scheduler is a program. Um, and, and on Graham and in most all of the supercomputers in Canada and most other ones as well, um, using a scheduler called Slurm. Um, and every scheduler has different commands, but the principles are very similar. Um, you submit a job to the scheduler using a command, in this case, the sbatch command. You give that job script to sbatch. It looks at what you want uh, and what you want to do with it and tries to figure out when it's your turn uh, to run that script on a computer. Mode. That's how things run on the computer. Mode. Completely off, off uh, hands off. Um, you don't get access to them. Um, just your jobs um, uh, have to be submitted to a scheduler. Okay. So now this is annoying when you're first starting. You want to get more work done, and you have to do all this stuff. You submit a job, and it might not run right away. And so I get that. Um, but if you keep jobs in the queue, you will get more jobs more work done because they will run on all these compute nodes that are available. Right? So it's a it's a sort of an investment if you want. So um, we're going to try that. So for our second hands up um, is to submit a job on Graham. So we run the login nodes. Now we want to run something on Graham. And I've prepared something for you so you don't have to write the whole thing yourself. So of course, we're logged into Graham. That's how we start. So try and, try and follow. If you're already logged in, good. You're in a good spot to start. And as we are going along, ask questions. Uh, let us know what isn't working. I tested it this morning. It should work, but you know things happen. Um, so as I said, um, you should do work on the Scratch directory. Your home directory is where you have your source code, yeah, some of the important results. Um, it is backed up. Uh, Scratch is where you do your work. If there's temporary output or output that you're not sure if it's correct yet, it should all work on Scratch. Um, and then once your job is done, you can figure out what to do with the data. Do you need to keep all of the data? 
Um, maybe you should copy it back to home. You have a lot of data that you have to keep open. You can request space on a project folder, but that is not really something we're going to do in this workshop. Going to scratch. We're going to copy over the material. So I've put in my directory, my home directory, uh, some material. So you have to copy over slash home, slash arson, slash force, slash arc, intro arc. That is where it comes from. It's a directory which you want to recursively copy. That's what the dash r is for. Here. And then where do we want to copy it? We want to copy it to our scratch directory, so dollars com. So try and get this and make sure this is working. Um, and then you'll get the directory that is also called intro arc in, inside of this scratch directory. And by the way, also let me know if it does work, um, not just if there's trouble, because otherwise I'm just looking at a screen that's not doing anything. When, when you have copied it over, you can you can go to the directory and you can see if things are there that should be there. Should just be two files, to be honest. Yeah, the scratch directory should already exist. Uh, just make sure you have a dollar sign and that you have capitalization uh, correct here. And one thing I noticed with the guest accounts is different from regular accounts. Regular accounts, if you have one, they have a link to the scratch directory in your home directory, which is convenient and confusing at the same time. Um, these accounts do not have that link, but the dollar scratch uh, environment variable should exist. So if you do cd dollar capital capital scratch, it should get you to, to that uh, to that directory. Ramses is a question about data privacy, uh, and if any user can steal other users' data. Uh, so, so no. Uh, so that's a good question. Um, the account. So in in Linux, there are three levels of access by the standard. There's a user access, so that is you. There's a group access, and there's an other access. Um, by default, on Graham at least, um, the only access to your files is is user, so your own. Um, you can make it such that uh, other team members, so other people of your group, can see it. But that's a, a choice you have to make deliberately, and you can change permissions. So by default, you can only see your files, and nobody else can. Um, on Niagara, if anybody's worked on Niagara, it's different. There, the default is uh, that your group can see your files, and you can switch that off. Um, but on Graham, 
uh, Cedar, Narval, uh, Beluga. Uh, the default is that you can see uh, just your own files and nobody can see your files unless you change the permissions. So for instance, the directory that you're copying here, home, arts, on, course, intro, arc, I had to explicitly change the permissions so you guys can copy it over. Um, and it, may, it, it can be those two files. Okay, so once you have the files, you can submit the file. Uh, make sure you do these two lines first, uh, export as batch account and export as batch reservation, because otherwise um, um, you won't be using the reservation that we set, set aside and, and it shouldn't run. Um, and then the command to submit it, this uh, particular job script called sweep underscore bond break dot sh is as batch. Um, I'm saying that somebody says that there's a long wait, so I'm going to try it just to see if that's uh, if there's an issue. Okay, no, there's no issue. Things are things should be running. When it says uh, minutes left in the queue, this JavaScript is asking for a whole hour of computation. It probably won't need it, uh, but it's asking for that. And so if it's running, it's going to tell you how much more uh, it's going to run. So this this last command, sqme, um, will say I will list all the the jobs that are in your queue, in the queue that are yours. If you just do sq you get everybody's job, which is which is way too much information. Um, don't even know why that's legal. But in any case, that shows your file and it will show you if it's running or if it's waiting or not. Uh, another good, good, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, there's another good question uh, in the chat. Uh, are there strategies for knowing how much memory or memory per seat you to allocate your job if you're unsure how much memory you need? The, the strategy is to try it out. So you should have a sort of a test job, uh, either that is as big as you're going to run but shorter run, or if you know how things scale in terms of your memory, so you have a data set, it's a, it's a thousand, uh, and you're trying with 10. Uh, when it's running, and let me, I'll, I'll show you that because I've got it running, you can actually go, or afterwards, you can see how much memory is actually used. So you're going to, at first, just say, give me all the memory on a node or something like that, which is a lot of memory for the test job, so it doesn't really waste too much resources. And you can check how much memory it uses, and then you can adjust. Um, so it, it, there, it is rare, possible, but it's rare that you know ahead of time exactly how much memory it's going to use. Um, the defaults, um, uh, before you get hit with any sort of penalty, that you can ask for is four gigabytes, or actually 400 megabytes per core. Um, so that is sort of a uh, safe bet. A lot of applications do not need that much memory. And so then it pays. But the default you get if you don't specify memory is something like 2,000 something megabytes, I think, which could be too little. Now let me show you what's running for me right now. So I've got my bond break here. I'm in the directory. If you want to know what directory we're in, um, the pwd command tells you that. So I'm in my scratch directory. If you want to see what's in it. Uh, the original two files, bond break and street bond break, are there. Um, there is an output directory, which we'll see was created by our 
a command and a uh, an output file, and we can look at the output file, and it says what's going on. So we're at simulation 42 or 500. So this is going to take a little while, um, but that's that's okay. If you if if you're at this point, things are working properly. Right. What is this doing? Right. Um, so we submitted something and something is running. So um, I'm going to be a bit more specific. You can gloss over this. That's fine. Um, this is actually a simulation of a, a chemical bond that's breaking. So imagine there you have a, a molecule of two atoms. Two atoms have a bond between them. And uh, their energy landscape is like this, where there is a minimum um, if they are bonded. But then if, uh, if they can, they can escape uh, by, by going over an energy barrier and get unbonded, so those two atoms will be flying apart. The question that it is trying to answer is, um, if we start with a, uh, a bond extension um, that is bonded, how long does it take before the bond breaks? And it will eventually have to break uh, because, uh, because the energy is lower when it's unbroken. But the only way it can break is by jiggling around. So we imagine this molecule to be in a solution where there's thermal uh, fluctuations, and so by thermal fluctuations of its uh, extent, it will eventually be able to go over it. How long does it take? So it's a question of what is the breakage time to, to, to get out there. So the model parameters that would go into this, because we have to know that, is where do we start? What's the initial bond length? So what's the bond extension? And what's the temperature? So temperature too low is going to be, uh, it's going to take too long or to escape, the temperature is high, it will jiggle around a lot and it will jump out. Um, the question is, as a function of temperature, or for a given temperature, how long does it take for it to go over the barrier? Those are the model parameters, but then we have to also decide on simulation parameters. So um, the way that the simulation is done is in time steps. How big is the time step? Um, how long should you wait? At some point, we have to stop uh, the simulation and just say, well, I guess it will never escape. Um, there's randomness here, so those thermal fluctuations are random, so there's a seed that determines the exact sequence of randomness. Um, and in fact, we want to try different random seeds because we want to average over all possible situations. Um, then we want to write out the data, so what file does it go to, um, how often do we want to write the data, and um, what's the name of the file that we want to write log messages to. Um, so there's the data, that is, say, the extension as a function of time. But there's also things that say, hey, the bond hasn't broken yet, or and these were the parameters. So those are log methods. That's the setup of the application bond break. And whenever you have an application and it's properly written, it should come with documentation. And hopefully, it would come with documentation that is sort of self contained. So when you ask this application for help, so you, you invoke the application with bond break. Because it's in the current directory, that's what dot slash does. So the bond break is in the current directory. That's just help. It gives us help. So it says exactly how we could use this bond break application. It's a command line application. It's actually written in Python. So if you're interested, feel free to just poke around in it. Um, it's not, you would normally not implement this in Python because it's slower than, uh, say, C or Fortran, but um, it has done that. Um, it has a bunch of options that sets all of these parameters that I just mentioned. So that's what the application does. What does the job script do? So the job script is setting a specific temperature. And for different uh, for a range of seeds, it's just trying to see how long it takes for the bond to break. So you give it temperature, how long does it take? And try that 500 times and just you know, uh, collect those, those times. So we will get. Uh, in essence, a, a list of times that we can do statistics on later. So this is a job script. A job script has two main parts. Uh, there's a first line that just says this is a bash script. So it's written in bash. Um, I think you can use C shell. You can probably even do Python, although in this case, it doesn't really make much sense. 
Um, so we're writing in bash. Fine. And then it has these aspect lines. So those are the lines that are for the scheduler. Those are the lines that say what the resources are that you want. So we, the resources we want here, we want from just one task, one core is enough, uh, for a maximum of one hour, and for and we just set the memory to one gigabyte, just for uh, we don't know what, so we just set, set it to something. Um, those are resource requests. The scheduler reads those lines and is going to put you in the queue for these resources. Okay, at some point, there's going to be the core free and, um, and it's going to run there. The rest of the script, when we give it to SBatch, is just kept. It's just the scheduler goes, OK, I'm holding on to that until it's time, until I found a time where you can run on these resources. When it's finding that time, then it runs the script on the resources it's found. So we're submitting on a login node. Um, the scheduler keeps this. When it finds a compute node that satisfies, satisfies the resources, it will run the rest. So what it will run? It will run some module load command. Those are ways to access software. And most software requires some module commands. Um, so we, we want to use Python. And our Python script, the bond break, turns out to need uh, NumPy. So that's in the side by side. Those are the modules. Um, we set some variables. Uh, those are parameters. Um, we create a directory uh, for the output, by the way. So that's the directory that we saw up here. And then we have a for loop for different seeds. This is one way to go, go over uh, a set of numbers. So seed will run from 1 to 500. And for each of them, it will print out what number it's doing and call bond break. Okay. So it's passing those parameters bond break. Um, what they mean, we could see from the bond break dash help. But essentially, it sets the temperature, the seed, the output file, which goes to the output directory we just created. Um, there's a, a data file and a log file, and they both go in that directory, nice and tidy. Once all 500 have run, um, those log files turn out to have more than just the breakage time. So we're just going to get the breakage time with a specific command. Um, how it works, I'm not going to get into. It filters out just the breakage time from these log files and puts it in a, a break time file. Okay. So two parts, resource requests, stuff to do. Make sense? So we were all just running this, and it, it will it's, it's not a huge task, so it will eventually do those 500 cases. So let's look a little bit at the scheduler part, because the what part is really specific to this problem, and it's probably not your problem. Um, but the scheduler part is your problem. And that's what you're going to use. So let's look at the Slurm scheduler. So what does the scheduler do? It's the one that is in control of the compute nodes. Uh, or cores. And it is supposed to fairly share these resources among all users. So um, it doesn't work in, in the way that you get some cores for a particular user, and when they don't use them, they are idle. Um, that would be a waste. Uh, instead, you submit jobs, right? And then each job specifies the resources it needs. Those are the SBatch lines. Um, so the resources could be time. Could be the number of cores, could be the number of GPUs. We're not using GPUs as an example here, but we could ask for those. The scheduler takes those resource requests and basically does a puzzle. It tries to find the time slot where to allocate the job. So if there were no other constraints, it would just go, OK, what's running now? What's ahead of you in the queue? Um, while there, when new resources uh, become available or other jobs stop, I'm just going to use those resources for the next node in the queue. On a busy system, um, the allocated time, so when things are running, is always in the future. So we, are, we have almost only busy systems. Um, you, your job, the reason that the jobs ran so quickly now is that we did reserve some nodes for, uh, for this training session because it wouldn't make any sense to wait longer than the training session. Okay? Um, but usually, you're waiting for at least uh, uh, the time until some jobs have finished so your jobs can run. Okay. How long you wait is unknown. It depends on a lot of different things, but you will have to wait. Okay. Um, 
Now, scheduling for a whole cluster is hard. It takes time. And because it takes time, um, there are some limits on what you can do, how much you can submit at a time. You cannot submit a million jobs. The scheduler will choke. It will be spending all its time trying to figure out when something is run and never finish, and so never and actually running anything. Um, so the number of jobs is limited. Um, this, the time that your job should take should also be uh, a certain minimum. Uh, say, if it's, if it's less than 15 minutes, um, it almost doesn't pay to have it scheduled separately. So you want to bundle several small, short jobs together, which is what we did, right? These were fairly short jobs, each of them, each of the 500 ones. We just wrote a loop. So there's one resource request, but we're running quite a few competitions. As I said, the time that you wait will vary a lot, and it depends on a bunch of factors. It's not first in, first out. Um, there, are, there are priorities at play here. So there's an annual competition that uh, the, the Alliance runs, uh, or previously Compute Canada, um, where you can, you can ask for resources. Groups, PIs, uh, professors can ask for resources in the coming year. And then the way that that works is you don't get those resources. You get a priority that would average out to those resources if you just use the system the whole time. It's a target resource. Um, so if you have, uh, if, if you're, say you have an allocation of 100 nodes, and you're asking for a job with one node, that priority is going to be really high, and it's probably going to run quickly. Um, if you have an allocation for five nodes, and you're asking for 10 nodes, you're going to be waiting a while. It's more complicated than that, but that gives you an idea of how priority determines when what will run. But also past usage. So uh, one thing we want to avoid is that a group, either accidentally or because they can, run more than their allocation, because there were some free nodes. right? So they run, say, twice what their allocation is. And that would mean like half through the year, their allocation would be done, and they can't compute anymore. And that's silly, because they were just using resources somebody else wasn't using. So we're only counting fast uses up to about two weeks. But if you do, if you use a lot of your allocation in the last two weeks, your job's uh, uh, priority go down. You have to wait, because it's other people's turn. Uh, time also is a factor. So the longer you wait, the more priority you accrues. In other words, you sort of bubble up to the top of the queue eventually. Um, and also available resources and job sizes. If you have a large job that needs many nodes, those nodes have to stop doing the jobs that we're doing before, so you have to wait longer. If it's a single node or a single core, chances are pretty quickly one of the cores is going to be done with its job and you can run. So um, too many factors to really tell. Um, you kind of have to trust it that as long as you don't overuse your allocation uh, or whatever this, the average fair share is, um, the, the scheduler is doing its best. When you're using the scheduler, so when you're running the sbatch command, there's a bunch of parameters. You usually put them in the job script, even just for a reference. So that's what we've done. Our sbatch command uh, options all went into the job script. The time is dash s time. Uh, you can abbreviate it uh, to dash t. Uh, dash s nodes, the number of nodes you want. You don't get a whole node. Uh, you could have a, a one core on each node. Um, so if you want all of your cores on the same node, make sure you say that's just node equal one. The number of tasks, um, that really comes into play when you're doing these MPI, uh, multi, uh, yeah, these it, MPI uh, jobs I was talking about. Um, we have one task here only, right? CPUs per task, so a, a specific task, one job script could run several CPUs, and we'll see how to do that. That's going to be an interesting one for us. Uh, GPUs per node, we're not using that. You can ask for memory, um, which we did. You should ask for memory, probably, or you get a very small amount. Um, and you can also put the account in the reservation in your job script as aspect parameters. We used environment variables, um, which is just an easier way to have it work for several uh, job scripts in a row. But when you're doing this in production, you really want the account in the reservation, if there is one, uh, probably in your job script for reference. So sbatch is the command you will use to give a job script to the scheduler. 
SQ, we already saw that shows you the two jobs and their status. Um, so um, SQ, that's just me, for instance, gives you this, this your job. If you're going to cancel a job because you made a mistake or it's gone far enough, um, as cancel uh, with a job ID. So if you noticed, um, when you typed as batches, it gave a number. That's called a job ID. And with a job ID, you can cancel the job. Once the job is done, you can see how well it did, what it did, how much memory it used, uh, how much of the CPUs you requested it was actually using with the S, uh, F command, set command. Um, so it just gives you job script. It doesn't work very well for jobs that are still running. Um, it gives you some number, but you can't really trust it. Um, so you have to wait until it's done. Um, you can also do interactive jobs for small resources. And those are good for testing. So if you want to see if you say your job isn't working, it's crashing very quickly. Um, you don't want to have to submit a job and uh, uh, wait a day and then have it crash again. Um, so you can do an interactive job up to three hours, I believe. With, uh, with S alloc, uh, with modest uh, uh, core counts, and you can get you can get interactive access to a compute node. But it is for a short. It's really for debugging if you think about it. So that's what we're doing right now. Let's see if my yeah. my simulations are still running. They're about halfway. So it's going to take another 20 minutes or so for them to uh, to finish. Any questions? I see most of you are running their stuff, so that's good. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about how you program a supercomputer. So the JavaScript is in Bash, and that's because it's Linux, and Linux uses Bash, and it's, it's good. But it's really not a fast language. So there's a particular application that it starts in this case, so it's bound break. Um, and they're written in other languages, typically. <laughs> Um, kind of two categories of languages that exist. Um, one are the compiled languages, uh, C, C++, Fortran, CUDA, or HIP, which run AMD uh, GPUs. Um, they're compiled in the sense that you give it uh, a source code. It translates that whole thing into machine language. And when it has done that, it can run it several times. That translation allows for a bunch of optimizations that you don't have in the other set of languages called scripted languages, of which Bash, Python, and R are an example, where translation is done sort of on the fly. So as the application runs, it reads the next line in the script and uh, compiles it, so to speak, or at least executes it. And it tends to be slower, uh, more flexible, but slower. Um, and so for the high performance computing stuff, people like to use compiled languages. But more and more, you see a combination of the two, where um, you might be using Python, but using a package that, like a, a module, or a, 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 that is written in C or C, C++, or even in Fortran. So for instance, if you're using NumPy, or SciPy, or um, TensorFlow, or those are packages that contain code that was compiled. And so they're actually not that inefficient uh, they're actually pretty efficient as long as most of this stuff is done in that framework. Um, so um, you usually get a combination of the two. But uh, that it's it's good to know that if you're really going for high performance, you want to make sure that this is a compiled code that you're running, whether it's through Python or natively in C, C++, Fortran, etc. OK, so we're at the point where we're running something. We're running something that we could run on our own computer, right? It's 500 cases. It's going to take about 40 minutes. Um, right. But you have to keep in mind that, of course, the idea is this is a simple example. In real life, we would have something that would take much longer. 
and these 500 cases we're doing would take 500 days. Um, the only way around it isn't running on a supercomputer, because I already said a supercomputer is just as fast or slower as your own computer, but it's to do things in parallel, so parallel processing. So no faster cores, <coughs> just more cores. Speed up comes from having something to do for all these cores. And um, there's no automation here. This, this, you will have to say what happens in parallel. And you have to find parts of the program, part of the scripts that can be done independently and concurrently. Um, and you have to have many parts. So if you want this to be 500 times faster, there better be something to do for 500 cores all the time. Right? Um, also, because it's, it's supposed to be independent, <coughs> the order shouldn't matter. So we shouldn't care if case 1 is done uh, before or after case 100. Um, if that matters, we cannot do them in parallel. Um, and so, <coughs> specifically, if you have a workflow where there's data dependencies, so the se several steps and the, previous, the, the, the next steps depend on the output of the previous steps, you can't do those steps in parallel, obviously. So um, this is also why it, uh, just having a script that exists can't be automatically parallelized, because there's no way to know, unless you wrote a script and knew why it's doing and what it's doing, what parts can be parallel and which cannot. So there's work to be done. You have to find the concurrency and then ask for those to be done in parallel. In the best case, which is kind of the case we have here, uh, we have what's called a parameter sweep. So we have a set of different cases um, with a different parameter, denoted here with mu for no particular reason, and each of the mu values gives a different answer. And obviously, they could be run because they're not communicating in any way on a different processor, and you get more done. So this would take uh, four hours on a single core. It will take one hour on four cores. Simple. Get more done. The way you uh, categorize, or sorry, the way you quantify that is to look at the throughput. So throughput is a very important concept, maybe the most important concept in supercomputer. It's how many tasks you can do per unit time. I've called it H because all of the other measures were taken. But it's the number of tasks per time. And I don't take this too literally, but that's what it means. So if we maximize this, this throughput, we get done as much as possible. So <clears throat> that's what we want. We want to get done as much as possible. <clears throat> so we're turning this a little bit on its head, right? Things were not fast enough. We want them faster. What we get is more cores. They are not faster. What we have to switch to is try to get as much done as possible per unit time. Again, in this simple case, um, uh, rather than having uh, four serial jobs taking uh, n times the time of a single job, um, so the throughput is one per c1, uh, when we have like n, uh, when we have p processes running at the same time, um, basically the time goes down with a factor of p, and our throughput is p times faster, p times higher. Linear scaling with p, the number of processors we're going to use. So we can plot that because that's a very interesting graph here. It's a linear line. Um, the task per unit time grows linearly with the number of processors we throw at. Um, so we have the same number of tasks in total to be done. We just take more and more cores, and it's faster and faster. This is called linear scaling, also called perfect scaling. And it's the best that you can get. But you will probably never actually get this kind of scaling. Right? So another way to look at it is to see how much faster things have gotten by looking at the speed up. So the speed up is the time that it took to do it serially, just with a single core, divided by the time um, when you take P uh, cores. And you, know, you, you plug in the numbers. It's really just proportional to P in this uh, ideal case. So the speed up, you can here take eight times as many processors. It is eight times faster. That is assuming already that there is more than one thing to do, right? that we can have something that divides it up. If we have only one linear set of instructions, um, there's going to be no speed up, because it's just a single core doing it. These are called embarrassingly parallel applications, um, because there's not much to be done except giving different tasks to different cores. But it is the best thing you can have. So if, if your whole research is embarrassingly parallel, you should be very happy, because your stuff is going to go through fantastically fast. Doesn't always happen. Okay, so we're going to have 
fairly good speed up because we have this ideal case. But what can go wrong? One thing that can go wrong is that it's there's parts that cannot be parallelized. So there's some parts of the workflow that are not parallelizable. They cannot run at the same time. So for example, suppose we have some tabulated experimental data. Uh, maybe it's a, a survey of our land or whatever, and we want to integrate it. We want to sum it all up. Um, how do we do that? Now, there's a part of the algorithm when we do that. So the algorithm, roughly speaking, is, is as such. First, we have uh, split up our region of tabulated data into four, and we could sum up each region separately um, and then get the answer by summing up the, the partial results. Okay, so we've got some data. We split it up in, in this case, four, but how, however many processes we have, each of them has a part of the data that it sums up, and at the end it reduces all of them together by summing up the partial results. Now, the middle part is parallel, but partitioning the data is not. It has to, something has to give different parts of the data to different processors. And likewise, the reduction, I cannot reduce all of them until they're all done, but I cannot even, um, I mean, it's, it's one computation, right? So there's parts here that are not strictly parallel. Make sense? Okay. So if there's parts that are not parallel, I cannot increase, I cannot decrease the time that they take by using more processors because they are not running in parallel. So we're going to do a few uh, definitions. We'll define the time t sub s as the time for the serial part. So say the partitioning of the data and the reduction takes some time. And that doesn't change. Let's say, that, let's say because it will change. Let's say it doesn't change with the number of processors we have. So let's say that partitioning the data does not increase linearly with the number of regions. It's just a one time something. Um, and the tp is the time for the parallel part. So all of these regions together form tp. So for p equals 1, for one process, that's the sum of the time of these four regions. Okay. So running this on one processor would take a time ts plus tp. Right? Yes, plus tp. Running it on p processors will parallelize the parallel region, so slash that by p, but not change how long the serial part actually takes. So if you compute the speed up, that is the uh, serial time divided by the parallel time. Um, we can get an interesting law called Amdahl's law. And um, we can simplify, simplify this by defining what is called the serial fraction of a computation. So that's the time of the serial part divided by the total time that it would take when it's not, par when it's not parallelized. Okay, so the serial fraction, the fraction of the computation that cannot be parallelized. And uh, with a little bit of uh, rewriting, you can write the speed up as a, as a function of the serial fraction and p. And so if the serial fraction were zero, if there was nothing in serial, so the embarrassing parallel, then this really says s equals p, right? But now something else happens. So let's look at an example. If the serial fraction, the part of our, our computation that cannot be parallelized is 5%. 5% of the time, not that great, not that big a deal, you would think. As you increase the number of cores, the ideal scaling is this blue line, the straight line. What actually happens is very quickly, um, this Amdahl's law tells you that you will deviate from it. And you almost get like a 50% reduction by the time you've only used 16 cores. Um, and it, it actually plateaus. So as you take more and more cores, um, the speed up plateaus and doesn't get any further than one over F. So in this example, you can never speed this up more than 20 times. And it, if you think about it, it makes sense. The TS is never gone. You always take TS, right? So um, at some point, you can throw as many cores at it as you want. It doesn't get any faster because all that is really happening is that one single core is taking care of the serial part of the code, and that has to be done. So that's one thing that can happen. You have non-serial, non-parallelizable parts in your code, and you want to try and minimize those, but that limits your scalability. Another scalability issue can happen when you have non-locality. So 
moving data around is slower than working on data that's already there. So especially when you have uh, multi-node computations, um, you want to make sure that you compute where the data is already uh, resides. If you have to communicate it, it's slow. Um, I don't have a good example for it here, um, but there's a lot of a lot of the machinery and architecture of computers is built around this idea that you are computing locally. So imagine if you had to download data before you can do something, you have to wait for the download. If it's already on your computer, you don't. If so, whenever you're splitting up your work, you want to keep in mind that the work and the data should go together. Um, so on shared memory systems, um, you want your data to be processed by the core that generated it, because it actually turns out that mem shared memory systems have uh, some form of locality. If it's a distributed system, you want to have the data on the node that's going to use it. Um, if you're on a file system, or even if you're accessing memory, um, if you're jumping around with different files that are on different parts of the spinning disks that are in the back end, um, you violate this, non -lo this locality principle as well, and things can be slower. So you want to do things like access data uh, contiguously. So if you have one big file and you access it linearly, that is better than a thousand files uh, or jumping around in a single file. Um, and if you already loaded the data uh, in memory or if you've already used it, reusing it helps it. So again, that those are um, when you're designing a workflow, um, things that you have to keep in mind. And another thing that can go wrong, even if you have this case that we have, which seems embarrassingly parallel, what if those cases take different times? So suppose you have 32 computations to do, and they're all independent, and it would scale differently, but each of the 32 cases takes a different time to run, and you do not know which one takes long or, or short. Okay? In fact, that's exactly what we have in our bond break state. Right? We want to know when a bond breaks, then we stop the simulation. If the bond break happens, happens soon, we stop the simulation soon. If the bond break happens late or not at all, we stop the computation later. The, 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 the runtime is, in a sense, an outcome. So we cannot know how long it will take. Okay. Now, suppose we want to speed this up anyway, and we have eight cores. One thing we could try to do to run it in parallel is say, well, we'll just take eight cases and run them. And then when they're done, we'll take the next eight cases, and we will run them. And then when they're done, we'll take the next eight cases. So in this case, four sets of eight. So if we're running, if, if you sort of visualize that as time running downwards and the core running from left to right, um, this is what's happening. Core zero is busy. Numbering starts at zero, say. Uh, core zero is busy for a little while, and then it's done. Core one is busy for quite a while. The other cores have shorter runs to do. And that's our set. The next set is more balanced. Uh, it will take very similar times, but runs a little longer. Um, the next set, there's again one time that one instance that takes a long time. And so you see a lot of uh, uh, voids here, which are idle times, right? But it, you know, we can't know that that's going to happen. We're just running sets of eight. So we want to do something better. better. This is what's called a load imbalance. Some of the nodes, some of the cores are, are busy, while others are not. And we, we just are, in a sense, wasting resources, but we had no, what else can we do? Right? Well, it's a pretty bad efficiency hit here. Um, our speed up of using eight cores is actually only 3.4. So it's pretty, pretty bad. What if we can do better? What if we do something like this? Uh, what if we can give a new task to every core when it's done? Basically, we're running our own scheduler. Then we get this situation. So it starts with the same set of tasks. But when, say, I think this core, the sixth core here, when it's done, we'll just give it the next one, the one that would have otherwise run much later. Right? So as soon as the core is done, give it the next task on the list. At some point, we're running out of tasks. So at some point, we're going to have some voids. But it's so much better. Right? We can hardly do better without knowing how long it takes. So we've got uh, a speed up that is actually much more acceptable. So this is what you want to do. You want to load balance. But writing this or coding this in yourself is uh, tricky and error prone and not necessary because there's a tool that does that. 
So the tool that we're going to use to scale up our, uh, our so far serial code for the bond break is called New Parallel. Um, here's the reference for it. If you're going to use it, here's the reference. And there are other tools, but this one is really uh, nice because it's very versatile and it's, uh, it's still under active development. Um, and so if something's wrong with it, you, you, know, you could get it fixed in the next version. Um, so don't code this yourself. Um, we're going to use New Parallel to, uh, to take the calculation that is probably just about to finish um, and do it uh, much, much faster than the 40 minutes that it, it did so far. So we're going to look at New Parallel, but I think this is a good time to take a little break. Um, if there's any questions, I'm going to stick around a few minutes. Uh, feel free to ask some questions, and then we will resume, um, let's say, 11.10. Let's take a, a little bit of a longer break. Um, but I'll, I'll be around to just look at some, some questions. Okay, I think we'll continue. Um, <clears throat> okay, where are we? Okay, so we're going to look at the tool that helps us do load balancing of otherwise independent jobs. One way we could try and do that is submit every single one of these 500 processes as a one core job to the scheduler. But if I, but I tried to explain already, the scheduler won't like that. Um, it will actually probably take longer to do the scheduling than do the actual running, and so that's inefficient. So we're going to use something where we can take a chunk of resources and run our own simpler scheduler called New Parallel. So it's, New Parallel is, is basically a script. Um, it's, it, it's great for running things in parallel. Um, so we'll, so we'll kind of see how this, uh, how this works. <clears throat> so let's look at an example first. Here's an example where we're running these 32 cases that I was looking at. Um, here's the job script for it, for it if you run this in, in GNU Parallel. So if we did not run it in GNU Parallel, if we just ran it one at a time, uh, you have to imagine that this uh, this shaded area, I think it's sort of a reddish shaded area, is what you would run. You would CD into a directory, you would run an application, and then you write out a job on it's done, and you go on to the next job. And each of these lines could be done independently, and so that's what we're going to use GNU Parallel for. It's a job script, so we're going to ask for a single node uh, with one task, uh, eight CPUs per task. So now we're getting eight cores. It's still one task because this whole job script is seen as a task. And so we're going to get more cores, but one task, and then New Parallel will use those CPUs. We're asking for an hour. Uh, we give it a job name. We haven't seen that option yet, but you can give your job the name. It's a New Parallel X8. And let's say we're using 4,000 uh, 4, megabytes. So we're running run, we want to run these 32 cases. <clears throat> Instead of running them just like that, we, we wrap them into a parallel command. Uh, so parallel is the command to run to parallel. It will run things in parallel. And uh, J will uh, tell it in parallel how many cases to run at the same time. We want that to be the same as the number of CPUs per task. Oh, so this should have been eight. I think this works. It should be their CPUs per task. Um, sorry about that. So this is a typo. <clears throat> but if we if we replace this with eight, this is scratch it, replace with eight, what will happen is that it will take the first eight, the barrel will take the first eight lines, um, execute them. Whenever one of those cases is done, it will take the next line and put that on the next on the core that is free, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we'll do exactly the load balancing that we had in mind. So the EOF here is a is a way to pass uh, a file that's not really a file into a command. So um, you can imagine this being a file, but it's not a file. It's just a bunch of lines. This EOF business makes it a what's called a here doc. So it's a, a, a file that exists just on the fly here. And it is passed into parallel. So the parallel reads this as if it was a file or as if it was just uh, typed in. That's what it does. And AOF, AOF stands for end of file. So um, there's two of them one that sort of says, hey, 
I'm going to start a file, wait for the end of file. This is saying wait for the end of file, and this is the actual end of file. If I leave out the end of file, it would try and keep reading, and it will never finish. Uh, if I don't say what the marker is at the end, it will not know when to stop finding. So these are finished. <clears throat> So uh, as I said, what Gnubarrel will do with this, it will assign these sub-jobs. So each line is a sub-job to the processors. As soon as one of them is done, it will get the next one started. And it will continues to do that until all the sub-jobs are done. And so there's, there's built-in load balancing in the sense that um, un until there's no more jobs to do, all cores are kept busy. Um, you can use Gnubarrel across multiple nodes, but I'm not going to show how to do that because it's a little trickier. So for all, that's why we're asking for a single node and all the tasks to be on that node. Gnu Parallel is able to launch jobs on the node that it's running on, not running on, but it's a little tricky. Um, this job script um, will run, so if you had multiple nodes, the job script only runs on one node. So something else has to launch the jobs on the other nodes. That's why it's better to stick to a single node. <coughs> Now, um, it has a bunch of extra options we can do. Uh, we can keep a log of what's run uh, and what is not run. We can keep a log of how long each subject took, um, whether they were successful, so what their exit status was. Uh, all these things are there. Um, there's a question, can you define task here? So task, in this case, uh, well, there's two tasks. And that's because we have Slurm and we have us. So Slurm calls tasks anything it has to uh, has to launch. And so Slurm will have to launch this job script. That is one task. If, we're, if you're doing uh, MPI programming, Slurm will have to launch more than one task on different nodes, and then the number of tasks will change. But for our purposes, Slurm is only launching one task, and that's why end task is always one here. But for us, we would consider each of these a task. Each line is a task that can be done separately. And so from a new parallel point of view or from our point of view, I would call these tasks. But um, so there's two different um, entities here, the scheduler. And for, it's the, for the scheduler, this is one task. For us, these are separate tasks. So whenever a task is done, new parallel will launch a new task. But that's nothing to do with slow. That's why it's a little tricky. Um, Define that. I hope that made it a little clearer on the, uh, the other way around. And that's also why I'm trying to keep, when I'm talking about these jobs, trying to keep uh, to the nomenclature of sub jobs. So it's not a, a Slurm job, it's not a Slurm task, it's just a, a sub job, something that we want New Parallel to do. And that can be done independently. Right? Those are the, the independent parallel jobs that we can do. Uh, syntax matters, obviously, in GNU Parallel. You can do dash dash help, and we'll sh show you everything. You probably want to look through the tutorial if you want to get a, a better handle. But some of the main ones um, to be used are the number of jobs that you run at the same time. So there's test dash jobs, or for short, dash j. Um, so that should be the number of CPUs that we're using. Um, we, I, I strongly effort or, or um, encourage people to use the job log option that writes to the log file that you give, so you replace it with the name of a file. It tells exactly what has run so far, and, 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 and so you can keep uh, a record of this. And it's very important, particularly if, for instance, you miscalculated how much time your job is going to take, and um, it runs out of time, and so some of the sub-jobs are done and others are not. How would you know which one has been done and which one hasn't? The job log will tell you. And even uh, better, if you have this job log and some of them did not finish, um, you can run the same uh, job again, but add the dash dash resume, which will skip everything that was done so far and will just run the jobs that haven't been made. So you can sort of recover from a, a too short a job. The limit on the job time, like in Slurm, depends on the system. Um, on, uh, on Niagara, it's 24 hours. On Graham, I think it's seven days. Uh, uh, on Cedar, I think you can still run longer. Um, but at the same time, 
if you ask for too much time, it will take a longer time for the scheduler to find the spot. So you, it's a balancing act. Um, you want to ask for enough time to finish your job, um, and um, but not too much because then it takes a longer time to schedule. Uh, somebody asked, if they, yeah, if you if you change n tasks in the job script, you get more CPU. So if you start playing with the number of tasks here, and you have CPUs per task, you get basically the multiplication of the two. If you don't specify CPUs per task, it will probably still work um, because you still get the CPU. So, but then the default is one CPU per task, and so. Yeah, if you make n task 6 and this is not specified towards 1, you get 6 CPUs. So the number of actual cores you get, oh, by the way, just to make it more complicated, um, Slurm calls cores CPUs. So that's, that's you know, Slurm has its own way of calling things. So whenever you see what FX says, what Slurm says, it calls uh, CPUs cores, and so that's, that's how many you use. Uh, yeah. Okay, now this syntax of new parallel um, of uh, this EOF business is a, is a bit error prone. We have to type every command, and um, they're all similar. It's easy to make a typo. If we have 200 cases or 500 cases, like we have, this is going to be very annoying. <clears throat> so you can actually write it in a different way where you use a template. So use a template of the same command every time. So I give it to GNU Parallel, and then I start streaming in the parameters that it could substitute. So the substitution string here, the replacement string, is an empty set of curly braces. And so it's going to replace those with 1, then 2, etc., assuming that I have the, the numbers 1 until 32 here. And so it's, it's just error prone. I only have to type the command once. Um, it's, a, it's a better way to do it. <coughs> Um, you can you can play with replacement strings too, but I, I will just refer to the, the new parallel parallel documentation for now. Okay, so we, we've got that. This is what we have now. Um, you can also not create this temporary um, file, this EOF file, this here doc, um, by giving all of these parameters as a parameter list. And the way you say that it is a parameter list is three. Uh, yeah, three colons, so colon, 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 the spaces on by either side. Um, and so what it, it is, it is exactly equivalent to this first case, but um, it would be tricky to do this in the original case where each line has a, a set of uh, commands, right? There would be a very long line and there'd be tricky ways to get the quota to make sure it happens. But in this case, we just have a, <clears throat> a set of numbers Excuse me, and um, we can just type the numbers in. Still a little bit longish, but it has the same effect. And still, we can do still better. So we can generate a list of 32 lines, sorry, not 200 lines, 32 lines, uh, with a command called sec32. So what that does is, it's a, it's a small utility, it's a Linux utility, whose only task is to write lists of numbers. So this will write a list of numbers of 1 to 32. So again, exactly equivalent to that. In fact, it's, it's not new parallel that expands this, it's bash. It's, it's the Linux shell that says, oh, you want to call this command and then put the output here. Um, sure. Um, what's nice about SEC is you can also have uh, step sizes. So if you want to take uh, numbers from 0 to 200, the steps of 50, again, that's, that's possible in this sort of thing. So we have, in the first case, this is exactly equivalent to the, first, to the original script. We get the same commands. We have a list of 32 uh, parameters that get substituted in. What if you have more than one parameter? That's possible too. So I suppose I wanted the commands to print out two, word, two numbers, a uh, second number and a first number, um, that are taken from uh, two different parameter sets. Here's a parameter set of 10 numbers. Here's a parameter set of, what is it, one, two, five numbers. This creates every possible combination of these two parameters and substitutes them in the command. And so since there's two different ones, I have to use a number to say which gets substituted. This is a very powerful way to have Nuperl create 
a bunch of different situations uh, without you having to write out every possible combination on the command line or in a file or in a here doc. So we have a, a template, a set of parameters that can substitute in it, and in a parallel that will run, will run these commands a certain number of, of uh, cores at a time. So we're going to try and use this because our JavaScript should be done by now. And we want to speed it up by running more on more cores. And so we're going to try this. It's going to be hands on. This one might be a little bit dependent on your level of uh, bash profic proficiency because you're going to have to edit the, uh, the file in place. But let's, let's give it a shot anyway. Um, so we're going to try and compute our uh, bond break calculations are 500 repeats of the computation. Um, it took about, let me check how long it took. It should be done now. Yeah, it's done. Um, it's, right, what we want to do is change this script using GNU Parallel. And let's say we're using 16 cores, although you can try 32. And just I guess um, depends a little bit on how long you want to wait um, on a single compute node of RAM and then sub submit the script. So it really, the first thing is to try and create a version that can do GNU parallel parallelization. So just to be even more specific, so my, uh, my stuff is done. So I want to see how uh, successful it was, how efficient it was. I can uh, do Seth on the job ID. So I used about 2% of the memory, but I used most of the CPU. Um, it took about. 40 minutes, it's completed, successful. Um, but you know, this was a single core. So we're going to want to change. And you can use any editor you want. What's available, I think, by default are things like Emacs, Nano, um, and VI. Uh, so if you don't, if you have not done a command line editor, I, I strongly recommend using Nano. I do that because in the bottom here, you can see all the commands you can use and how to use them, where a, uh, a caret means control and an M means the, well, at least on my keyboard, an alt uh, key. So if I wanted to get help, it would be control G. So if I type control G, it shows me the help. If I want to get out of this help, it's control X because it says so here, control X, close this, and I'm back in my thing. But what's nice about this editor is that you can just start typing and most of the regular uh, keystrokes work uh, without, without, uh, without to do. If you want to write, make a, a change, you want to write it. In the bottom, it says Control O is how you write out. Control O, and it asks you what file to write to. You press Enter, it wrote it. Okay. Um, so we're going to change this. We're going to have to do something with SPatch. We ask for resources that have more than one core. We are going to have to change this for loop to something that uses new parallel. Um, and that runs all of these cases. And then we have to submit the job. Is it kind of clear what the ideas of this exercise? Yeah, okay, great. So let's, um, yeah, let's give ourselves at least 10, 15 minutes for that. Ask questions where you go along, that's fine. Um, and then we'll, uh, uh, even if we're not all done, uh, hopefully with enough questions, we'll get an idea of how it's how it's done. And uh, I, can, I can show you a solution. I realize I have more slides than I can finish, but these are, this is the important part of, uh, 
of the presentation anyway. Um, some of the other stuff you can you can read on your own uh, without without. Me. Okay, so yeah, go ahead. Let's uh, let's give this a try, and uh, and ask questions in the chat if you if you feel like it. I'll put up uh, before we st no, we might have started already. Um, I have a few tips. Issues to keep in mind when you're doing this. Um, so there's no magic here, and all the little pieces will have to fall in place. But if you just put parallel in front of a command, that won't be enough because you wouldn't have asked uh, Slurm to give you more resources. If you just ask for me more resources, so you do CPU per task issue 16, but you don't change the script, then the script is going to use only one of those cores. So again, that won't work. You have to combine the parallel and the ask for more resources. Um, if you if you don't if you do compare correctly and even if you ask it to run in parallel but you didn't ask for the resources it will only get one core so it won't run any faster. <clears throat> um, keep in mind when you do the, when it does work your output is going to go in any sort of order right um, <clears throat> so don't be surprised with that <clears throat> and be sure to run your scripts through SPatch. I think most of you already did that in the original script so that's fine. If by accident you run your scripts without sbatch, you will run it on the login node, and the login node will get overloaded. Um, and it's, it's not what you want. Uh, probably your job or your, your script gets killed anyway, but that's, that's uh, make sure you use sbatch. So these are just a few things to keep in mind as you are trying to change the scripts to do things with Nubera.
Um, hi, Ramses. Um, you're mute. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> question. Is it question time or why are you recording? No, no, you can have a question. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, it's something very necessary. Uh, could you touch base a bit on how to load softwares in our home directory? other than the stuff that's available in the cluster. Let's say you want to download something on the side. It seems it's a bit complicated and the website does not show exactly, like CMake does not work, config does not work. It's, uh, I was reading about it yesterday, but it's a bit uh, complicated process. Could you touch base on the process, how to do it? Yeah, sure. No, it, it, it's actually not the, the, the only trouble <clears throat> is that a lot of instructions that you find on the web assume that you're installing it in your own machine where you have root access, which you do not. So um, CMake works, um, config works, um, autoconf works, um, but you cannot install anywhere but in your own home directory. So let me see if I have an example. Uh, Can we install? What do you think about it? So, <clears throat> let's say, for instance, that I'm going to make sure. Let's okay. say I wanted to install something. In my directory, right? Um, okay. So there's, for instance, a package called, uh, it's a testing package called Sketch2. So I've got a URL for it. I'm going to get it. Here it is. The name is a little bit funny, but this, this is an a application that installs with uh, CMake. So I just unpack that. Go to the directory it created. Um, it might be good to load a new CMake, module load CMake, but CMake works as well, I think. So let's do CMake. But of course, we want to build it in a build directory. So one of the things you do have to worry about is that you, you have to give it a prefix, right? Okay. So maybe you want to build it in H2. This is doing. Make. So the, the the trick really is to make sure you, you give it a prefix. And then if you give it a prefix, this takes a little longer than I expected. The the make install is going to do it in the directory that you gave.
And so in my home directory now, I have a catch2, and it has an include, and the libraries and the man pages are on there. So does that make sense? And I, I could actually clean up the whole other. I don't need the actual source file anymore now. Done. If you run into any other trouble, always you can always write to support. Uh, what is it? Tech Alliance can Alliance can .ca. So that's the email for for questions. If somehow you uh, it doesn't work. Um, all right, thank you. So basically, David get get the URL and then unzip and then. Uh, and then make function. Yeah. Load the CMake and then CMake function and then type in the end the dollar sign prefix. Yep. Okay. For uh, for configure, um, it's probably something like dash dash prefix equals. Um, and yeah. That's, yeah, but that's that's the only thing. So sudo won't work. And then when you're building with with a library like that, you might have to tell that build system where things are as well. But that's a uh, yeah. Anyway. How are we going with the uh, the parallelization, folks? I do not know who is who, but I do see a few people are trying things out. Oh. So, oh yeah, yeah, oh, sorry about that. The underscore should be dashes, but I think James already, yeah, sorry, that's, that's my mistake. Should be CPUs dash, Per dash task, um, and if you only do that with no other modifications, indeed, it's not any faster um, because the nothing is running on more than one core. The script, the job script itself, will start running on just a single core. That's all it does. It's a new parallel that can start things um, on other cores. There's other ways, obviously. It's not the only thing that can do it. Um, or MPI run if you're doing MPI, but that's that's how you get access to the other cores. Um, parallel echo simulation here, something like that. Yes. Hard to see syntax from the. In the chat, but let's just let's try it then. Let's try it. Uh, we are going back to scratch. Let's copy this into a new scripts. Use Emacs just because I'm used to the keystrokes. But. Okay, so we are going to need uh, memory should be fine, but let's just ask for a little bit more. Um, we're going to need uh, CPUs per task 16. We want to make sure, although I think this might be automatic, that we have one node, so they're all in the same node. Um, this is all fine. Okay, so this is the one we want to change. Okay. 
to be open there for now. Um, so the seed is running. So that's going to be my parameter. Okay, so that's going to be my thing that I'm going to give to parallel. I want it to run on 16 cores. This looks good, this looks good, this looks good. I have to give it the parameters. And that's actually the exact thing that I had up there. Num seed set. So that looks about right. And we should not need this anymore. Let's see. It probably takes less time, but just for uh, to be safe, at least the first time we can run it. And then we might want to do something like a job log. I edited the old version, that doesn't really help. Okay. Okay, Let's see if it wants to do that. Running, it says it's uh, 16 CPUs, 4 gigs. So at least the the slurm part went well. We're running. I'm going to use you a trick that uh, show you a trick that we didn't put in the slides. You can actually see that it's running on uh, the node gra 648. When you're running there, you should be able to run to SSH to it just from the logger node. Done already? I have done something, probably went wrong. Okay, let's see. It's not finding something. Sec missing operands, that's not a good sign. Num seeds. So it wouldn't have done anything. That's why it was done so quickly. And that's why I didn't find anything. Okay. Let's try it again. Okay, let's run it again. One line. Okay, and then with the top command, I can see what's running. I just want my oh, uh, my stuff. Okay, it seems to be running a bunch of Pythons. That's me. And each of these have a, a different PID, so that's the process ID that changes when it launches new ones. So we can see it running properly. Uh, and this Perl thing, that is exactly the GNU Parallel uh, script itself. So this is the progress log, so the job log. You can see there's a number here. And you can see they're not in order because they're, they're, they don't have to be. And it's, it's giving you what it ran exactly. Uh, what the exit status is, how long it ran. So some ran like five seconds, some 0.5 seconds, so large, large variations of, of that. Um, 
So if we, if it is indeed 16 times faster, then uh, this should be done in a couple of minutes, right? So yeah, we'll, I'll show the script again. Absolutely. Now that I know that it's working. Uh, here we go. <clears throat> If FH says it can't open a file, you probably missed, you probably didn't type the name of the file correctly. Um, or you're maybe in a different directory. Um, Oh, yeah, Nano um, cuts off the uh, the line here. One way to alleviate that in a in a bash script is to uh, to split this command over two lines, but that won't work uh, unless we say that it's one line really. And so, if you end a line with a slash in bash, it means Continue the line on the next line. So. You uh, you noticed maybe that I I left out the echo command. And that's because I have a job log, so I don't really need the echo command anymore. It makes it actually a little bit cleaner anyway. Okay, I can uh, I can post this one on the on the site afterwards as a example of a solution if you want you just uh, start wrapping up Okay, so the rest of the slides are just some tips on doing research computing, and we won't really have the time for that. But they consider things like best practices on writing maintainable code, um, automating things, writing scripts, using version control. If you've not used version control, go uh, go to this session uh, that James is going to give on uh, on Git. Um, it saves you uh, from a lot of these issues. Uh, document and comments. Um, there's no such thing as completely self-documenting code. Write things for yourself. Um, document things so that in six months you will understand what you were doing, or your co-workers that you're collaborating with know what you're doing. Um, that's very important. Uh, try different computers. You're going to do that anyway because you're going to be on a switch computer. Uh, skip that one. Uh, checkpoint is one thing I do want to talk about quickly. If you can't finish your job in time, so for instance, on Niagara, you can't run longer than 24 hours. If your competition takes longer, it has to be able to write something out towards the end of the 24 hours from which it can resume on the next job. It's the only way you can do it. And it's actually a safeguard because things happen. Uh, power outages, um, things break. Um, the systems have been set up such that data doesn't get lost, but your job is done. And so if you write it, if you write your jobs in a way that they can resume from when something went wrong or when the time ran out, um, that's called checkpointing. And that's what you want. So in New Parallel, we saw we can do that with the job log and resume. Um, other Applications typically have a way to to do a checkpoint, uh, to a, do a start, uh, a checkpoint restart kind of thing. Um, it doesn't come as a feature of the system. It's not automatic. It would take too much to 
dump the whole memory to, to a file or something like that. It would take too long. You have to do it, but it is a good thing to do. I.O. Uh, one thing we did not talk about at all, but file systems are the slowest part of any supercomputer. It doesn't matter what supercomputer, and it, it doesn't matter if it's fast. There's a few things you can do to help. Uh, don't create a bunch of little files, um, and um, don't do more I.O. than you need. It's, it's like a general guideline. There's limits on the number of files, on the size of things. Um, things have to be backed up. All of these things matter. Um, but as long as you keep in mind, and, and they matter even more on, uh, on the shared resource, because if somebody does do bad I.O. and slows down uh, the scratch file system, for instance, all jobs run slower that use I.O. And everything, everything wants to write out. I.O. by the way, it's input output, if you haven't heard the abbreviation before. OK, so read those in, uh, read those over on, on your own time if you want. Um, they contain good tips, but they're not that essential to the introduction to ARC. So what I hope um, you will take away from today's session is um, civil computers are shared resources. They have multiple users. Uh, you use them from the command line. Um, that's, that's how they run. They use batch computing, so that's what I mean with job scripts submitted um, and are then run by a scheduler. Um, you should try and do parallel processing, otherwise they are not going to be faster than your own computer. Um, their file systems are shared. One thing we did not have to worry about is to copy over, say, our uh, bond break application to the compute nodes, because the file systems are visible everywhere. So they're shared and they're parallel. Um, uh, we have a scheduler for fair sharing. So that means that if you overuse, your priority goes down. But if you don't, uh, it's fair compared to all the others. Uh, the connections are remote, uh, and you have no graphical interfaces, really. Um, don't forget, if you haven't yet, take the attendance test. Um, it might say that you're late. If it says that, uh, write an email to us or uh, to support at uh, tech.alliancecan.ca and, uh, and let us know and we can correct that if it's right. Um, we're not submitting an assignment. There was no time for that. So uh, never mind that bullet point. And take the evaluation survey if you're done, uh, please. So we know how we did and we can make it better the next time. And with that, I, I thank you for your attention. I will stick around for a few more questions if you have. I'm happy to, uh, to chat. But uh, I thank you all.